start with our prayer book, as Woody said, that um, it's prayed for every day, several times a day and weekly. Um, just, and if you need, uh, if you'd like a decal, send a good address to Brother Woody and he will send this to you so you can put it on your refrigerator or on your car. Men, please remove your hats, please. Heavenly Father, please take care of everyone this Christmas season. Take care of our church and all the churches around us. The children that are off for holidays, take care of them. And um, our uh, trail life and uh, girls, Heritage Girls program. Um, amen. Thank you, Margo. Thank you, ladies. How is everybody today? It's good to see everybody. It's a little brisk out there, but it is nice. After uh, We've needed the rain really bad, but it's nice to have a little bit of sun uh, shining down. It's good to be here. Thank you, Pastor Woody, for allowing me to bring the message today. This is that time of year to where uh, everybody's focused on Jesus. Uh, we should all be focused on Jesus every day of the year, but uh, thankfully uh, this time of year brings it around. And we always have to remember that it's not about the trees and the, the presents and the things like that. It's about God, God is done for. So we also need to remember the people um, who this isn't necessarily a joyful time of year because of uh, they suffer from depression or things like that. Um, it's it's a, a, a what's the word I'm looking for? It's a glorious time of the year. I really enjoy this time of the year. I always have, but I know that uh, it can be hard on some people. So uh, we have kids. It's always good to have kids. So we're gonna pray them up and pray up the children's service and our service, and we're gonna get started today, gentlemen. If you'll move your hats again. Dear Lord, we thank you for allowing us to come together like this. We thank you for allowing us to be a part of your kingdom, to allow us to gather as your children, Lord, and just to, to praise and lift you up and, and just be, be one, Lord. We thank you for the children, um, the children who are here today. We thank you for the boys and the girls from Trail Life and American Heritage Girls. And we ask that you'll lay your hands upon every child around this lake area and everywhere in the world. Uh, there's many of them out there today who don't know you. Um, they barely know Christmas. Uh, we know that there's many struggling families out there who, who are in need of help. And we just ask that you uh, touch the people who you want to help them, Lord, and just allow us to reach out in, in the way we're supposed to as the church and uh, help these people and teach about Jesus. We ask that you'll be with Miss Terry as she brings the message for the children, Lord, and just uh, teach them better about you. And I ask that you'll just empty me out of this body, fill me with the Holy Spirit, Lord, and just direct me in the way you want this message to be directed. In Jesus' name, we, we ask these things. Amen. So again, it's it's very exciting. Um, the fact that Christmas is on Sunday this year to me just really, really amplifies it. Um, I was actually surprised at the number of churches that are not going to be open on next Sunday. Um, yes, I have been hearing more and more about churches who want people to be with their families. And you know what? We should be with our families in church. We should bring them to church. When they come to town, take them to church. And if you're watching online, take them to your church. Um, it is important for us all to gather with our families and spend time with our families. That's what a big part of this part of the year is about. Number one is Jesus. We need to remember Jesus. We need to get into the word and, and, and know who he is. And then there's our family. And we all have those family members that we don't get excited about seeing. <laughs> but they're family. So we need to always remember that. That, uh, you know, you get to choose your friends, but you don't get to choose your family. But everybody has certain people in their life for a certain reason, and we may not know that, but God does. Um, as we uh, approach this season, uh, you know, you, you have all kind of different denominations and all kind of different people who look at things differently. And, and one question that some people always ask is, did Jesus really come for the whole world? Uh, we know that he came for his people, but who are his people? Well, he came for everybody in the world. 
He came to lift everybody up if they choose to be lifted up. In John chapter 12, verse 46, it says, I have come as the light of the world that whomever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And it's up to us. Anybody can go to heaven. But you have to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior to do it. And we know about all the prophecies that were related to the Messiah in the Old Testament. Woody covered a few last week. Um, and the whole Old Testament is about the coming of Jesus. There's bits and pieces that are about the discipline of, his peop of the, the Israelites, but it all revolves around why we need Jesus, the reason we need Jesus. Um, and he is coming to save his people. He came as a baby. We're going to celebrate that next week. The next time he comes, he won't be a baby. And there's going to be a lot of people in this world who aren't going to be happy to see him because they're going to think that he's coming for them and then he's going to, they're going to realize that because they did not know this book and they believed what somebody on TV or somebody who was uh, in it for the wrong reasons was telling them, it's not true. But we also wonder as we approach this is does God really understand us? How could God know us? You know, we, we go through these things every day. Each of us has our own issues and our own problems. And how can the perfect Lamb of God understand what we went through? How can he understand me? I mean, I'm a messed up person. I got a messed up family. We all have that. And you would think the Lord and Savior who was sent here to save our souls would have had a perfect family. You would think that his family, if anybody's family was perfect, would be him. But it wasn't. In Mark, not Mark, in Matthew 1 and Luke 3, chapter 3, there are things that most people avoid called the genealogies. And I'm not going to read them. I'll just tell you right out. Um, these things, when you try to get into them, they will twist your tongue right out of the socket. There are some that are really easy to say, and there are some that, only God can say these things. It is, can be pretty tough. But these are Jesus' relatives. Some names you're going to know. Some names you won't. Um, but Jesus' family is just as messed up as many of our families. And this is important for us to know. It's important for us to know to be able to realize that Jesus does know what we go through every day. That is why he went from a baby to the cross so he could experience everything we experience on a daily basis because how else can somebody ex ex understand you if they don't know the things you've been through the difference is he was perfect and he did not sin but he understands he was tested in the wilderness for uh, 40 days by the devil no less um, we all like to say the devil made us do it, but there's not, a, no, there's, not enough, there's not many people in here who rise to the level of the devil himself actually coming after you. He's not omniscient. He's not omnipresent. He's not everywhere. So he has to focus. And I'm not Billy Graham, so I know it's not him. Most of the problems I have are on me, on my flesh. Um, but if you go down through the lineage, either Joseph's side or on uh, Mary's side, they all have a lot in common. And we have a lot in common with them. But the one main thing we have in common with each and every person who is in that family tree is sin. Everybody has suffered from it. From the time Adam and Eve and the fall of the garden, we've all suffered for sin, except for one, and that's Jesus. And we should strive to be like him. That should be our when you're thinking about somebody you look up to be and aspire to be, we each should look up and aspire to be just like Jesus. So as we prepare to celebrate the birth of, of the one perfect person, our Lord and Savior, as we prepare to spend time with those family members that we rarely get to spend time with, some of them by choice, some of them not by choice, um, we're going to look back at uh, through Jesus' family tree and just kind of hit some of the high points of his family so we can better relate to um, 
we can better relate to the fact that everybody goes through these same things. There's nothing new on the earth. So Luke's genealogy goes all the way back to Adam. Matthew's goes back to Abraham. And really, if Matthew's went all the way back to a Adam also, then you would see the same people coming up to Noah. And since both of them have Abraham in the lineage, then we can all automatically guess that the same people come up through Abraham. Everybody, let's turn over to Genesis 12, chapter 12. We're going to start with Abraham, or Abram, as he's called when we first are introduced to him. And Abram was a faithful man. Abram simply got up and left everything he knew when God told him to. You have to have a lot of faith to do that. And this, excuse me, this wasn't a man who knew God. He knew gods. He knew of different deities. He worshipped, um, created idols and such as that. But the great I am, he did not worship him uh, before this. So he was told to leave his homeland by something that he didn't completely understand, but he did. Because if he hadn't understood it, he wouldn't have done it. We'll start in uh, verse 11 of Genesis chapter 12. And it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beauty, of beautiful continence. Therefore, it will happen. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say you are my sister, that it will be well with you for your sake, and that I may live because of you. So Abram feared for his life, so much so that he asked his wife to lie um, to anyone who asked about uh, their relationship and say that they were brother and sister. So first, what do you think Sarah is thinking at this point? Here is her husband who, because he is fearful of man, uh, doesn't want to let people know who she really is. We're going to continue in verse 14. So it was when Abram came into Egypt and the Egyptians saw the woman that she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abram very well. Uh, he treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys, and camels. At this point, I wonder if Sarah was thinking that she was just being traded for a bunch of farm animals. You know, you, we have to remember that the, their time was not the same as our times. We don't think the same. We don't live the same. But I believe at the heart of things, husbands and wives are always going to be the same. And he's walking away with a bunch of farm animals, and she's found herself in a harem. I wonder what the conversation was like when they got back together. Because um, it's just like God is the same now as he's always been. But he wasn't going to let this stand. So in verse 17, But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with the great plagues because of Sarai's, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What? is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me she was your wife? Everyone, no matter how far they up may be from God, can tell when God is there, whether it's good or bad. So when people a lot of times ask, well, what if they're not told about God? We know. And when things happen, we know. The Egyptian pharaoh knew something was up. Because at no place does it say that anybody told him why all this was coming. But it happened whenever Sarai had come in. In verse 19, Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now, therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all they had. Because of God's grace, Abram walked away with not only his wife, but the livestock that he uh, was giving during that time. And this wasn't the only time that Abram had done this. 
Go ahead and turn up to Genesis 20. We're going to be in verse 1. And there's no indication that Abram was a weak man. He stepped up and rescued his nephew Lot when he was kidnapped. In Genesis 14, we see that the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adamon, the king of Zebami, and the king of Bela went out and joined together in a battle in the valley of Siddim against Chedilomer. So this is why I didn't have y'all go to 14 because I want to say the words the way I say them and y'all can't test me if y'all can't see it. Um, they went out against Chedilomer, king of Elam, uh, title king of the nations, Ephraim, Amphrael, king of Shinar, and Arok, king of Elsar, four kings against five. And I was going to skip this part, but I felt that we needed to, it was important to know the kings. Anyways, the kings, um, the kings with, with, with the king of Sodom, they lost, and Lot and the others were taken away um, into slavery. But Abram armed 318 trained servants and pursued them. They went to battle against them and brought back Lot and all the other uh, women and the things that were taken. So Abram wasn't a coward. It's not like he was somebody who, who didn't have power and he didn't have people to support him. Um, and even after God's blessings, after God changed his name, changed his wife's name, he lied about Sarah again many years later. So we're in Genesis chapter 20, verse 1. And Abraham journeyed from there to the south and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and stayed in Gerar. Now Abraham said of Sarah his wife, she is my sister, and Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. And again, God intervened. In verse 3 we see, But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Indeed, you are a dead man because of the woman you have taken, for she is a man's wife. And again, Abraham put someone else's life and somebody else in a bad position. And we don't know how bad Abimelech was. I don't think he was a great man. But still, the fact that Abraham was so fearful for his life that he was willing to put a nation at risk is kind of sad. So in verse 4, but Abimelech, not having come near her, and he said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And she, even she said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hand, I have done this. And God said to him in a dream, yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart. For I also withheld you from sinning against me, therefore I, will let, therefore I did not let you touch her. Now therefore restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. And Abimelech did what he was told. And again, Abraham walked away with his wife, with sheep, with oxen, with male and female servants. It's a pretty good business proposition for him, apparently. He's making out like a bandit through these things. But Abraham was a great and faithful man. There is no doubt about that. Um, he left his home country and went where he didn't know to follow God. But even as faithful as he was, he still feared man. And we all have that uh, from time to time sometimes more than others. But it's, it's important that we remember that as long as we have Jesus, all men can do is to this body. And this body is going to fail us anyways. Uh, we're all marked for a certain length of time here on this earth. And if we fear man and we fear what men will do to us, then we're going to miss the great blessings when we lose this body anyways, when we go stand before the Lord. And we shouldn't want to leave this world any quicker than we should because we're here to do a job. But we always need to remember that more important than what happens here is what happens once we leave here. 
But we do find out that Abra Abraham, say I get confused, Abraham, he's Abraham now, um, he didn't completely lie. Because in Genesis, in chapter 20 and verse 12, it says, but indeed she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. So he didn't really lie, but he did kind of. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those, you know, it's, all, it's, it's, it's actually how a lot of uh, teachers teach the Bible now. It's how they view from what direction they view instead of what God has said. Uh, go ahead and turn over to Genesis chapter 38. Now, Abraham's grandson, Jacob, as most of us know, was quite the schemer himself. He was always working to get what he wanted and would do whatever it took. He even wrestled with the angel of the Lord, which we all pretty much know that that was Jesus. But he would not stop wrestling with him until he received the blessings that he sought. That's pretty impressive to be wrestling with somebody like the angel of the Lord and you're just going to hold on for that. But that's really what we should all do. We should always just grab a hold to Jesus and not let go. That's the only way we're going to get through this life. Um, and that's when he became Israel. Well, his son Judah also um, had his own issues. Genesis chapter 38, I guess I need to there. it tells us about Tamar, which was his daughter-in-law. Tamar had married Ur, Judah's uh, firstborn. And Ur was so wicked in the sight of the Lord that the Lord killed him. That's pretty wicked when the Lord reaches out and kills you because of who you are. Under Jewish law, Judah's next son in line, Onan, was expected to take Tamar and raise, her, raise, up, his, raise up heirs for his brother. If you were a man and you were married and you had no children and you had a brother, if you did not, if you died, then it was expected that they would supply sons in your name so your lineage would continue. But because, um, but because Onan knew that the children that he would father with Tamar would not be his heirs, he made sure that she would not get pregnant. And that displeased the Lord. And the Lord killed him. So, Judah had one more son, Shelah, and he wasn't really excited about giving Tamar to him. He had already lost two sons. I'm sure he knew something was up in that um, aspect. So he told, uh, Judah told Tamar that when Sheldon got grown, Shela got grown, that he would give, him to her, give her to him as his wife. So we'll start in verse 12 of uh, Genesis 38, chapter 38. Now, in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, which was Judah's wife, died. Ju and Judah was comforted and went up to his sheep shear, Timanah. He and his friend Hira and Edomite. And it was told to Tamar, look, your father in law is going up to Timanah to the sheep shear. Well, Tamar was pretty sure that Judah wasn't going to keep his word or follow the law. So in verse 14, so she took off her widow's garments, covered herself with a veil, and wrapped herself and sat in an open place which was on the way to Tamar, Timonah. For she saw Shelah was grown, and she was not given to him as a wife. And again, their time is not the same as our time. And a woman back then, if she didn't have a husband or a male child, she literally had nothing. She wasn't allowed to own property. She wasn't allowed to have anything. And in, for the most part, she was considered property. So a widow or a woman who didn't have a husband had to do whatever it took just to survive. Verse 15, when Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot because she had covered her face. 
So they negotiated, and she was promised a young goat. How times have changed. How many ladies would get excited about receiving a young goat in this day and time? But again, their time is not our time. Um, and he didn't have the goat with him. I guess he didn't travel with a goat in his pocket. So she was given his signet and cord and staff to hold until she uh, was to receive the goat. He was going to send it after the fact. But she wasn't after the goat. She only wanted these things that were uniquely Judah's. She wanted to be able to identify him without a doubt or have him identified without a doubt after the encounter. Tamar went home and put her widow, widow's garments back on and a short time went by and Judah found out she was pregnant. But he had no clue it was his because he still was not aware what had happened, which happens to many men. They're just not aware of what's going on. Um, a short time went by and, and Judah found out. Uh, we're going to pick back up in verse 24 of chapter 38. And it came to pass about three months after that Judah was told saying, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has played the harlot. Furthermore, she is with child by her harlotry. So Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. And that's pretty harsh. Now in Leviticus chapter 21, verse 9, it does state that the daughter of any priest, if she profanes herself by playing the harlot, she profanes her father, she shall be burned with fire. But there's nowhere that indicates that Tamar was the daughter of a priest. And in this day and time, in most cases of adultery and serious sins like that, you were just stoned to death, which I wouldn't say would be much better. But the fact that he threw out the, the fire thing of her being burned was, was kind of curious. So in verse 25, when she was brought out, he, uh, when she was brought out, she sent to her father-in-law saying, by the man to whom these belong, I am with child. And she said, please determine whose these are, the signet, cord, and staff. So Judah acknowledged them and said, she has been more righteous than I, because I have not given her Shelah, my son. And he never knew her again. Judah recognized why she did what she did. He didn't follow what he was supposed to do. And even with the deception, they are both in the lineage of Jesus. So again, most of these people are far from perfect, but they were still in the line of Jesus. And, and little things create big things, and that's why when they say, you know, even a white, little white lie can be bad, because everything builds once it starts. And that's why we always need to do what's right. We're not required, per se, to do what's right. But if you love Jesus and you have Jesus in your heart, then you're compelled to do what's right. A lot of, of what happens today, and I believe this builds on a lot of the issues, is we hear it when they go, well, if he'd just get in church. If he'd just get back in church, he'd be fine. All he needs to be in church. And church is a great place. We get to fellowship. We get to come alongside each other, and we get to help each other. But church doesn't change your heart. You need to be in the Word. You need to know God. There's a lot of people in a lot of churches right now as we sit here and speak all around the world who don't know God. They don't know Jesus. They're there for a social experiment or they're there just to be seen. Uh, they're there for their friends. So it's always important that no matter what we do, that it always comes back to Jesus. So let's turn over to Joshua chapter 2. I don't want to pick on just one group of people. We want to pick on everybody today. Um, there was Rahab, the pro a prostitute from Jericho, who found herself in the line of Jesus. We're going to be in chapter, I mean, we're going to be in chapter 2 of Joshua, verse 1. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So that so they went, and they came to the house of of a harlot named Rehab, Rahab, not Rehab, Rahab, and lodged there. 
So the king of Jer Jericho not only knew about the spies, but he knew that they had visited Rahab's house. So he sent a messenger to her to turn them over to him. Verse 4. And again, we're in uh, Joshua chapter 2. Then the woman took the two men and hid them. So she said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it happened at the gate, was, and it happened as the gate was being shut when it was dark that the men went out. Where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. Rahab had taken the men up on the roof and hid them, and the search party took off uh, on the road to Jordan. Verse 8. Now, before they lay down, she came to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that you, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are, faith, are faint hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you when you came, came out of Egypt. And you did, and what you did to the two, two kings of the Amorites, who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sia and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. So news travels fast, and even back then, without news channels and 24-hour-a-day news, when God did something big, it got around really fast. Um, chapter, I mean, verse 11. And as soon as we heard these things and our hearts melted neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you for the Lord your God he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath Rahab knew the power of God she only wanted to make sure that her and her family would be safe when these men came she had heard and the whole uh city of Jericho had heard. So they knew what was coming and they were very, very fear, fearful of it. So we're going to be in verse 12. And we're still in jo uh, Joshua chapter 2. Now, therefore, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you also will show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token. And spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that have, and all they have, and deliver our lives from death. So the men assured her that if she did what she promised, her and her family would be saved. As long as they, as long as the instructions they given, they gave her were followed. In verse 17 it says, so the men said to her, we will be blameless of this oath of yours, which you have made us swear. Unless when we come into the land, you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you bring your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household into your home. And as long as they followed the instructions, they would be okay. In Joshua, in Joshua 6, chapter 6, verse 17, it says, Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction, it and all who are in it. Only Rahab the, har Rahab, the harlot shall, survive, shall live. She and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And the Lord rewarded her. And all you have to do is be faithful. No matter what you've done before you come to the Lord, as long as you walk with the Lord after that, you're good. And I know there's a lot of people that think they've done so many bad things that they can never be redeemed. But that's not true. The third man on the cross shows that you don't have to do anything other than profess uh, that you believe in the Lord and you'll follow him. Now, as we hopefully discover and come to the Lord long before we die, as we serve the Lord, we will receive crowns. We will reserve, receive rewards in heaven. But what we do does not get us into heaven. 
Who we are doesn't get us into heaven. Who we know doesn't get us into heaven. Even if you're standing beside the Pope and you're a good friend with the Pope, that's not going to get you into heaven. If you're hanging out with Pastor Woody, that doesn't mean you're going to get into heaven. It doesn't matter who you know or who you are. You know, because most of the things that said, uh, it's not what you know, it's who you know, that doesn't apply. It's, well, that's not necessarily true. If you know Jesus, that's all you need to know. You don't need to know anything else. Uh, and it's important, and, and again, I say it often, Pastor Woody says it often, reading your Bible is the most important thing that you can do. There is a lot of people out there who say a lot of things that aren't true. And just as the devil did to, to Eve in the Garden of Eden, he uses scripture, but he twists that one little word. And that one little word can be the difference between whether you spend eternity with God or if you spend eternity in the uh, lake of fire. The eternal lake of fire. That was the word I was thinking of. So not only Rahab, there was Ruth, the wife of Boaz and the mother of Obed. She was a Moabite woman who forsaked her pagan heritage in order to cling to the people of Israel and the God of Israel. And she wasn't a bad person, but she also wasn't a Hebrew. Yet God rewarded her faithfulness to her mother-in-law, Naomi, and her faithfulness in a time of national faithlessness with a privileged position in the lineage of David and Christ. We don't have to be Jewish to get into heaven. We don't have to be Baptist. We don't have to be Methodist. We don't have to be Presbyterian. We have to be followers of Christ. And we always have to remember that. Um, there's nothing necessarily wrong with these denominations, but a denominations didn't come out of the Bible. There's two races, two types of people. There's Jews and Gentiles, and that's it. I believe the devil has used these different denominations to separate the church. And as time has went along, we have been separated more and more and more, and we've seen how COVID separated families. Families who truly love each other, this one virus, which was deadly for a lot of people, but it divided. And we can't let people divide us. We have to stick together. We have to stay together. Because as we see, even in our country, they're coming after the church. And if we don't stick together and be together and believe together, then it's going to be, it's an old saying that they, uh, after World War II, you know, they come after these people and I did nothing. And they come after those people and I did nothing. They're going to come after everybody eventually. And the people who are supporting the people are the ones who are really going to come out on the bad side because they're believing things that aren't going to happen. Anyway, so speaking of King David, and I think everybody here knows King David. Oh, yeah. <laughs> His life was full of wonderful achievements. He was a man after God's own heart. But one act of lust destroyed many, many lives. Not just Bathsheba and the baby that she would have out of the adulterous act. Not just her husband Uriah and his family. But David's family turned into an episode of Jerry Springer. <coughs> Sorry. David's son Abnon raped his half-sister Tamar, and this is not the same Tamar uh, as Judah's daughter-in-law. That She'd have been really old. Tamar's brother Absalom murdered Ammonon for what he did to his sister. Absalom, because of his anger towards David, his father, for his in, in, um, in, in action over what had happened to his sister, he gathered himself an army and committed treason against David. And Absalom was actually killed himself eventually, even though David had given direct orders not to do that. And something, and I, I didn't write this down, but something I found fascinating about family trees was the man who was second with Absalom and convinced him to go against David 
and helped him uh, in his treasonous activities was actually Uriah. It wasn't Uriah's. It was Bathsheba's uncle. It was some relation to Bathsheba. And when you go back and read that account, it looks so much different of what he's doing when you realize why he's doing it. Because this was David's number one man too. He had been beside David for many, many years and then he turned his back on David. And if you don't understand the genealogy of who he was and why he was going against David, it, it, it muddles the story. It's, it's not as clear. So even though they're hard to read and the names are tough, they are still important. Because as Paul said, you know, scripture, every bit of scripture is important. So we're going to get back to the family tree. So David's son Solomon, who was the wisest man that ever lived, had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Still not sure how you can call him the wisest man that ever lived. But that's what the Bible says, so that means it's true. So we have to remember that. Solomon, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, managed to split the kingdom in three short days of being king. That's pretty fast. Uh, and then there was Manasseh, king of Judah. Uh, let's turn over to 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 33. <coughs> Sorry, my throat is dry and scratchy today. Now Manasseh, who the Lord spoke by servants, his servants and the prophets, saying he had acted more wickedly than all the Amorites who were before him, and he also made the country of Judah sin with his, with his idols. And that's pretty serious when the Lord steps right out and calls you out in that fashion. Uh, Second Chronicles chapter 33, verse 2. Where did it go? There it is. But he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. For he had rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah his father had broken down. And Hezekiah was a faithful man. Um, it said in, uh, it says that he, uh, how did he say it? He did right in the, in the way of the Lord. Uh, he had tore down all the altars to other gods and uh, was bringing people back to God. But his son Manasseh raised up altars to the Baals and made wood images. He worshipped all the host of heavens and served them. He also built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. And he built altars, altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Also, he caused his sons to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Himon. Caused his sons to pass through the fire. The valley of Ben-Himon is, uh, is to the south and to the east of the temple. It was where the worship for Molech uh, involved the burning of children. So Manasseh sacrificed his children to Molech. I did see one commentary where they said that he just made them pass through the fire so that his, children, his sons would be dedicated to the idols, the idol deities, but... He sacrificed his children. I don't know how people do that. But we are in a similar society now. People sacrifice their children on a daily basis. But we don't call them children. We call them fetuses. We call them tissue. We call them these things. But they're not. God created them. And and if we're going to believe that disposing of a life because it's inconvenient, I got a six-year-old that gets inconvenient at times. <laughs> and, it, and it's kind of funny to think about, but reality is, what is the difference between a baby within hours of being born and my six-year-old grandson, other than he can talk? 
a lot. <laughs> all the time. But a baby can cry. So, you know, everybody has their own beliefs, and I understand that, and everybody has to make their own choices. But when we look back at, at in the Old Testament and even in history and we see these barbaric things that people did to their children we don't do it a lot differently we just do it in different ways um, a conversation and I'm getting way off subject but a conversation popped up the other day about why kids do why kids don't work and why kids aren't being more assertive in their lives now because everybody needs help nope I mean, every place you go has help wanted signs we, I'm just as guilty as anybody else, wanted our children to have a better life than we had. In a lot of cases, these children were not taught the ethic of work because we wanted to give them things. And it's wonderful for your kids to be happy. And it's wonderful for them to have things. But I have found, even at six-year-old, that if you're not making them earn it, they don't appreciate it. And we always have to to remember that even though we're trying to make their lives better, that there are um, unintended consequences to many things we do. And that's one of them, is we're living in a, a world, not just a country, but we're living in a, the Western world to where people haven't learned that they have to do to receive. And that's not good because we're slowly running out of people to do things. And I need him to work because that's my retirement plan. So, you know, we need to make sure that we keep these children going. And seriously, because of the way our government handles money, if we don't have kids out there working, who's going to pay the tax bills that, that our government has run up? Um, so we're going to continue in uh, verse 6. Again, we're in Second Chronicles. 33, we're going to pick up in verse 6, make sure I know where we're at. Um, he practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft and sorcery, and consulted mediums and spiritualists. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. He even carved images, the idols which he had made in the house of God, of which God said to David and to Solomon his son in this house in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever, and I will not again remove the foot of Israel from the land which I have appointed for your fathers. Only if they are careful to do all that I have commanded them according to the whole law and the statutes and the ordinances by the hand of Moses. So Manasseh was a really, really bad guy. And the Lord used the Assyrians to carry him off to Babylon. And apparently this got his attention. Because in verse 12 of chapter 33, it says, Now, when he was in aff affliction, he implored the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before God, before the God of his fathers and prayed to him. And he received his entreaty, heard his supplication, and brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. And Manasseh spent the rest of his life undoing the things he had done. And again, no matter how bad you've been in the past, you can be redeemed. Charles Spurgeon said of verse 6, I cannot imagine, I think, a worse character than this Manasseh was. He seemed to have raked the foulest kennels of superstition to find all manner of abominations. Like false-hearted Saul, he had dealings with a familiar spirit. He had entered into a covenant with Satan himself and made a league with hell. And yet, marvel of grace, this very Manasseh was saved. And he is now singing the new song before the throne of God in glory. How bad you are doesn't matter. It's what you're willing to do. And that is give your life to Jesus. All right, so I have some, some, some big names coming up here, so y'all be patient with me. Um, King 
Jehoiachin, uh, which was also known as Cohen and Jekana, who was the son of King Jehoiakim and the grandson of King uh, Josiah, only reigned three months and ten days in uh, 597 B.C. as king of Judah. Jehoiachin, being a descendant of Joseph, causes a bit of a wrinkle in Jesus being the Messiah because of what is said in Jeremiah chapter 22. And it's Jeremiah chapter 22. We're going to be in verses 29 and 30. Y'all don't have to go there, but just write it down. O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, write this man down as childless, a man who shall not prosper in his days. For none of his descendants shall prosper, sitting on the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. And not much is said about him in Second Kings or Second Chronicles where they talk about him. Uh, in Second Chronicles 36, it does say, Making sure I know where I'm at. In Second Chronicles, 30, uh, verse 36, it do, uh, chapter 36, it does say, "And he did evil in the sight of the Lord." And that was in verse 9. And in Second Kings, uh, chapter 24, in verses 11 and 12, it says, "Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city, and his servants, and his servants were besieged in it. Then Jehoiachin." king of Judah, his mother, his servants, his princes, his officers, went out to the king of Babylon, and the king of Babylon, in the eighth year of his reign, took him prisoner. Again, when we get into these names, I don't want y'all to see them. I just want y'all to hear how they flow off of my tongue. Very, very rocky when they flow off. Uh, and Jehoiachin died in captivity. Jehoiachin did have offspring, but he was, denied, he was deemed childless in the sense that he had no sons that would sit on the throne. He had been a very evil man, and God had cursed his bloodline. And the curse was not temporary, so it did continue in his descendants down to Joseph, uh, the husband of Mary. So how could Jesus be the Messiah when his father was under the curse. Well, Jesus wasn't blood with Joseph. Joseph was his father in a earthly sense, but in a blood sense, his father was God. Because Jesus was uh, virgin born, so man was not involved in the fathering of Jesus. So Jesus got his right to sit on the throne through Mary's side. Which is why there are two genealogies. Um, if you go start doing research, there's a lot of people who say the genealogies can't be true because they don't match. Luke does not specifically say this is Mary's genealogy. But through, um, down through the years, it has been shown that it is. And that's why both of them are there. Just to show that on either side that Jesus is who he claimed to be. Uh, so Jesus gets his right to the throne through Mary, who was from Nathan, Solomon's brother, not Solomon, who was in Jehoiachin's line, which bypasses the curse. Most of the remaining names you see nowhere else in the Bible. I did a lot of research, and they're just there. And I know that, that at least through the 400 years from Malachi to Matthew that there is nothing. We don't, we don't have any biblical records. I'm sure there is historical records, but unlike my friend Barry over there, I am not a historical person. Um, I just believe what the Bible tells me. And then if people back it up with uh, real life uh, historical facts, then I'm willing to take them. Uh, but most of the names you don't hear any, you don't see anywhere else in the Bible. Uh, Jesus' family tree, like most of ours, was far from perfect. We all have those relatives that we don't like to talk about, as we talked about before. Uh, but God wanted us to know that one, that no one except Jesus was perfect, not even in his family. 
And it is important to remember, whether we're reading Old Testament or New Testament, if this was made up, most of what's in there wouldn't be in there. When you go back and look what the disciples wrote about themselves, if you're trying to create something of a religion, why would you throw all this bad stuff in there? You know, why would you throw your dirty laundry in there? You know, you don't want that. Um, and, and especially when you're wanting people to follow you. Most people don't want to follow a cart full of dirty laundry. But that's what we have. But, but it's only because this is real. There, it's 100% real. And so it's important that we know the ins and the outs of everything that's happened through time when it comes to the Bible. It helps us to understand more why we need Jesus. And that's primarily what it is. The dirty laundry is in here so we all understand that no matter how good you are, no matter how perfect you are, no matter how great you may think you are, you're nothing without Jesus. And again, Jesus was foretold so many times throughout the Old Testament. All the prophets pointed to him. And God let us know, he would let us know, in the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi uh, chapter 3 verse 1 says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare a way for me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger to the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And then, 400 years of silence. We don't hear anything else until... Chapter 1, verse 1 of Matthew, which he likes to start up, which he starts off with the genealogy. So, we went from nothing to tongue twisters. Let's go over to Luke, uh, chapter 1. But there is one Old Testament prophet in the New Testament. God chose a couple who was childless, and a priest named Zacharias and his barren wife Elizabeth they were both advanced in years while Zacharias was serving as priest before God in the order of his divisions he was chosen to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord Luke chapter 1 we're going to be in verse 11 Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear a son. And you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice in his birth. So God had finally spoken. And with the birth of John the Baptist, he was preparing the world to receive his son. Flip over to chapter 3 of Luke. Should be a page or two over. We'll be in verse 1. Whew, more names. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of uh, Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip tetrarch of Ituua, and the region of Trachotus, and Lassanus tetrarch of Abilene, while Anas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of the Lord came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the regions around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. And it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. 
And John went out and preached to the people. And he knew who he was. And he knew what he was. And he knew what he was called to do. If you jump down to verse 15. Now, as the people were in expectations and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not, John answered, saying to all, Indeed, I indeed baptize you with water. But the one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal straps I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you in the Spirit, Holy Spirit and fire. So John knew what he was there for, and he knew he, who he was there for. Do you know who you're here for? Are you a child of God? Do you believe that you are here to spread the word about Jesus, or are you here to spread the word about yourself? We can do nothing without our Lord and Savior. And without him, it has been proven over and over and again in this, this very thick book and in my own personal life that when we try to do things on our own, we may succeed in what we're doing, but in the big picture, we fail. Because as much as it has been put into us, our self-loving and especially in the society we live in now to where it's all about me, 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 we have to remember that it's all about him, him, him. Because if we don't spread the word about him, the end is coming. We don't know when. It might be tomorrow. It might be next week. It might be a thousand years from now. But everybody's in this room's end is coming. And we don't know when. Um, Coach Leach, I don't know how many of y'all follow football, and, and I'm not a big football person, but he's the coach at Mississippi State. He was uh, coaching around here, I think in South Texas, Texas Tech. He didn't know he was going to drop from a heart attack, and it didn't kill him immediately, but it, it was fatal. And we don't know when that's going to happen. It could happen at any moment at any time. And if you, not many people have the ability to profess Jesus on their deathbed. And we need to remember that. Uh, we, we get second chances up until we take our last breath. And once we take our last breath, all our chances are gone. And if you don't accept Jesus, it's on you. Because as I've heard many times, is if you're going to go to hell, you have to crawl over Jesus' body to get there. Because God and Jesus has done everything they can to put him before you. And it's our job as disciples to put that before people not to beat it into them not even necessarily to force it in but as I've said before the things we do for people especially when we step out into the lost when we step out into the community we need to help them but we do these things to get the ability to speak of Christ because you can make people as comfortable as possible, but if you don't talk about Jesus, then they're just comfortable till they go to hell. And we want people to like us, but if they dislike us because Jesus, it's on them and not us. And we always need to remember that. Gentlemen, if you'll remove your hats, we will go to the Lord in prayer again. Dear Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for allowing us to come here again every week and lift you up and praise you. We thank you for giving us the knowledge that you've given us, the abilities and the skills to serve not only the people around us, but anybody who steps into our lives. We are here, Lord, to serve you. And by serving you, we serve other people. And we pray that everybody who is within earshot of this message knows you. And if they don't know you, we ask that you will touch their hearts and open their minds. And if there are people in our lives that, that we reach out to and they won't accept it from us, place somebody into their life who will accept you, who will talk about you, teach you, and that they will accept it from. We all receive God's message. We all receive God's love in different ways. And we have to accept that we can, may not always be the person who touches their life. But we pray that you'll put somebody in their life. And if you would like to know Jesus, if you would like to come before him today, what better time? We're celebrating his birth. And as we get closer to next week, 
the festivities just continue to pick up. So if you would like to know and come before Jesus, we ask that you'll repeat this prayer, and you must mean it in your heart. Dear Lord, I know that I am a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins, Lord, and invite you to come into my heart and into my life. And I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, I pray these things. Amen. And again, if you said these words, we like to welcome you to the kingdom. But you must mean it. The Lord knows what's in your heart, and he knows if you're just saying it just to say it. So it's very important that you are honest with the Lord because he knows. If anybody needs prayer, we ask that you come up here. Uh, and I know we all need prayer, so one line on this side, one line on that side. And let's get some prayer done, guys. Thank you all. Amen. But if you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're guaranteed to get into the, the pearly gates of heaven, if you will. So come to know him. You must come to know Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. It's not something that you just take for granted. It's not something that just happens. It is the free gift of God that he will give to you.